Our scripture reading this morning comes from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 4 through 5b. You shall not make for yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. <clears throat> Just bow your heads with me as we pray. Gracious Lord, speak to us today your message. Give us ears to hear, and may our lives be transformed as a result. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So, uh, I want you to know I called the home office to get a good joke for you this morning. Home office sent back a list of ten. I had a team of five scurry over them, make sure we got the best of the best of the best, and here it is for today. Are you ready for it? teacher was talking to her Sunday school class, and she, uh, she asked the students, what uh, religious items you have in your home? What are, what are some religious items you've seen in your home? And one boy answered, said, well, we have a picture of Jesus on the wall. It's right next to my daddy's chair in the den, and every morning that's where he sits and prays, right next to that picture of Jesus. Now, oh, well, that's, that's good, that's good, that's good. Uh, a little uh, visiting boy from the Catholic Church uh, chimed in and said, oh, 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 we got one of those. We got a picture uh, of Mary and uh, holding a little baby Jesus. got a halo on his head, and sometimes my mom kneels down by that uh, right there. Oh, okay, okay. Little Johnny was over in the corner, and he, he finally chimed in and said, oh, wait a second. I, uh, we got something, too. In the bathroom, we have this little platform with numbers on it, and every day my mother stands on it first thing in the morning and screams, oh, Lord, have mercy. There you go. All right. Oh, Lord, have mercy. There you go. No, 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 no. Really, seriously, seriously. No, I'm kidding. Um, I'll work harder next time, okay? I'll work harder. This morning, we're tackling the second uh, commandment in God's top ten, if you will. Uh, the one that was read for us today from the New International Version says, you shall not make for yourself an image. You shall not bow down to them or to worship them. Now, if that's not what you're used to hearing. Maybe you grew up with the old King James Version. And when you heard this particular uh, commandment, you heard it this way. Thou shalt not make any unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor to serve them. Now these images, or, or as the King James says, the, the graven images, uh, were very common back in the ancient Near East at the time when God gave the Ten Commandments. You could find, like I said, a temple on every corner. Every town had multiple temples in it. Uh, I guess if you were small, you didn't have a lot, but uh, there were places where you could go to worship all around to worship any of the many and various uh, gods, false gods of the ancient Near East. And what people would do, would they would not only attend worship of these things, they would also participate in a private way of worshiping the, the gods that were around them. They would create statues, or as is commonly referred to as idols. Just little idols that were in different shapes, of, of different images, uh, of different uh, uh, things that they created. Now they came in various sizes, uh, they were used, like I said, in the private worship, but also in public worship. You might find places that had larger idols to worship. People made them out of wood, or sometimes they carved them out of stone. If you had a lot of money, you might make something and, 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 and layer it in gold or silver, or make, actually make it out of gold and silver if you had a, a lot of money. Uh, if your family worshipped one of these false gods, or in many cases in the ancient Near East, they would worship multiple uh, gods in their home. Uh, what they would do is they would have a place in their home that was set aside for their, their private worship. They would have a table or, or a, a shelf or something along those lines and they'd have these statues 
up on these shelves, and that's the where they would. Uh, that's where they would worship in a private way in their homes. They'd have their graven images or their statues. Now, now these idols uh, weren't simply just a reminder of the God that they were trying to worship. Uh, they actually believed that these idols were in the embodiment, uh, or they had within them the spirit of that particular uh, deity, whoever it may be. And they might go to the priest of that temple of that deity and have them bless the idol that they've carved so that they would then be embodied with. They, that's what they believed. And, and they also believed that, uh, that they, these idols uh, gave them blessings uh, for particular reasons or for particular things. And so they, we've mentioned this before, they, the, the idols and the gods of the ancient Near East, there were many and various ones and uh, the gods had things to do with uh, what people needed or wanted in, in this world. So if you were a farmer, you would find out, okay, which is the god of the harvest, because you want a good harvest, and you would take time to worship the god of the harvest by having your little, your little idol, your little statue on your shelf. If you were trying to start a family, you would find an idol that was the god of fertility and worship it. If you were sick, you would have an idol for health and wellness. If you needed prosperity, there was an idol or God for that as well. All that was required of you uh, was to, uh, to receive the blessing of these idols or these false gods uh, was for you to worship the God uh, through your idol or through your graven image, to glorify it, to honor it, to lift it up, and to treat it as most important, the place you go to to, to get what you need uh, you would worship that particular idol. Now, it's confession time, folks. We just need to be honest with each other. All right, raise your hand if you've got a corner in your house with uh, some graven images on it, you know, little statues you've carved and had blessed at the local temple or whatever it is. Maybe it was to Baal. Let's go ahead. Just if you, Any Baal statues out there? Anyone? No? Okay. What about Ra, sun god, Egyptian? That's kind of popular, I guess, you know. No, no, none of that. Okay. What about, uh, what about Zeus? That's, you know, mythology, you know, uh, no Zeus statues in your, okay. What, what about, uh, what about uh, 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 Asher or, or Marduk? Any of these ring a bell? So no, one, no one's worshiping false idols then, huh? Ah, well, <laughs> it's been good being with you today. Robert, you want to come up and do the closing uh, hymn? Uh, no, 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 no. You're not going to get out of it that soon. Amen. That's right. That's right, Ryland. That's my amen brother right there. He said, give me the full sermon. Now, that's what we're going to do today. I, you didn't come for a half sermon, so we're going to go ahead and give you the full sermon today. Even though there's not one of us out here who has a little statuette area for these false gods in their home, it does not mean that idol worship is not a modern day issue in our world. We all still struggle with idols, but just in other ways. Now, the most common way that people today struggle with, with idols or idol worship has to do with making a god out of something that's not. Making a god out of something that's not. That's basically what they're doing. They're making a god out of these statues, but, but we do it in a different way. We take things that... Uh, that, are, that we place in value over God or is more important than God or we turn to these things. So uh, things that people worship today in idolatry would be things like money. If money is your number one and you, you worship the almighty dollar, guess what? That's idolatry right there. For others, it's power. For others, it's a position. Uh, for others, it's pleasure, uh, possessions, whatever it may be. Now, if I was a betting person, uh, I, I would bet you would think that's where I'm going to go with this sermon today. But actually, it's not. I'm actually, you know, we, we've talked about that at other times and other ways, and we'll deal with it at other times and other ways. But this, more, this morning, I wanted to talk to you about another form of idol worship. One that you may not think about, but is common nonetheless. You see, it's one thing to make a god out of something that's not. It's just as bad, however, to create an idol by making God into something he's not. Let me say that again. It's one thing to make a God or an idol out of something that's not. It's just as bad to create an idol by making God into something he is not. 
This is the struggle the, the Israelites were facing. The, Deirdre mentioned it in the, the children's sermon uh, this morning. They, they, they uh, gathered together all the gold. Remember, th- this, they were in the wilderness time. They they'd left Egypt. God had delivered them out, and they'd been wandering through the wilderness. They go to Mount Sinai. Uh, this is where God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. But it didn't happen overnight. Moses went up on the mountain of Sinai, and the people stayed down low. And he was up there forever. He was up there forever. And they got kind of tired. And they grew a little impatient. And so they turned to Moses' brother Aaron, and they said, Aaron, why don't you make for us something that would represent God for us so that at least we have something we can look at, we have something we can see. Uh, and so they gathered together all of their gold earrings and all of their, all of their gold rings, and, and they forged together a lot of gold, and they made this statue shaped in the form of a cow. Now, why a cow? I have no idea. It has nothing to do with Chick-fil-A, um, but it, it's just... For whatever it is, it was a cow. Yet this graven image that they made was not God. It was something they were allowing to take the place of God. But it was not God. What they had created, what they had done, was to substitute something created for the Creator. In what they assumed was the absence of God, they created an image of God for themselves. Uh, this was a God of their own making. Something they could put their hands on, something they could touch, something they could feel, and more than likely motivated out of a desire for something they could control. This is our temptation today, to make God into something He isn't. Let me say it again. This is our temptation today, to make God into something he isn't, to make God into something less than he is. In other words, um, we do this by making him into something that best suits our needs or our desires. We shape him into an image of, of something that, that best suits our needs or our desires, or by making him into something that best fits our understanding and experience, or by making him into something that best fits our political leanings or our moral standards, or by any other way we create an understanding of who he is, which is less than he has revealed himself to be in Jesus Christ and in his holy word. When we settle for, when we create God into something that he is not, something that is less than he is, we are, in essence, doing the exact same thing the Israelites were doing at the base of Mount Sinai. We are creating our own golden calf. Instead of the God who made us, we create a God in our own making. I love the way someone said a long time ago, he said, God made man in his own image, and ever since we've tried to return the favor think about that for a minute god made man god made humanity made us in his own image and ever since our sin nature our sin side wants to try to return the favor uh, how many of y'all know jeff foxworthy everybody knows jeff foxworthy you've heard of jeff foxworthy he's that comedian does the uh, uh you know the redneck jokes and and all that kind of stuff you know you're a, a redneck well if you don't know him let me give you a quick refresher course uh, he has the whole thing about you might be a redneck. If you can't spell your name without looking at your belt buckle, you might be a redneck. Say that with me when I get to that part, okay? Let's try it. We're going to practice that first one again. If you can't spell your name without looking at your belt buckle, you might be a redneck. All right. If you get your daily requirement of fiber from toothpicks, you might be a redneck. If you have to honk the horn when pulling out of the driveway to keep from killing the chickens, you might be a redneck. If you think cow tipping should be an Olympic sport, you might be a redneck. Well, I say that, or share all that, because I want to introduce something, uh, a book, really. And, And you'll see what I'm getting to here in just a second. Back in 1952, J.B. Phillips put out a, a little book. I, when I, the first copy I had, it was this navy blue one. Not very thick, but very powerful and deep. It was called Your God is Too Small. How many have read that book? Anybody read that book or seen or heard of it? Nobody. Oh, you ought to pick that up. It's a classic. It's a really good one. I recommend it. 
As I began thinking about this book that he wrote and how it ties into the message today, I couldn't help but think about Jeff Foxworthy and, and uh, you, you know, you might be a redneck. And so what I thought I would do is, is take this book and make it into uh, a sort of a, a you might be a redneck kind of a thing. We're going to do that. See, this book, basically what he does is he takes all of these images that people create of God and he expounds on them a little bit and talks about how this is a less than God that the world makes and and so here let me share with you some of the things that he says this is our jeff foxworthy reinterpretation of jb phillips book your god is too small if your god is someone who is just a traffic cop sitting up on his holy harley on the on overlooking the roads of life just waiting to give out tickets because he loves to write you tickets for your sins and to condemn you for it. If that is your God, your God is too small. If your God is a mild-mannered person who is powerless to transform your life, to rescue you and deliver you from sin and shame, if your God is just that mild-mannered person who can't do anything for you and is powerless, then your God is too small. If your God is nothing more than a kindly grandpa or grandma, who just welcomes you to his lap and overlooks your sinfulness, oh, that's no problem, then your God's too small. If your God is nothing more than a permissive guardian who lets you get away with everything and never calls you to a a higher standard of living, if, if, if this God's definition of love is permission rather than a love that calls you to holiness, then your God is too small. If your God is an absent-minded professor who just created the world and left it to go spin on its own so that we have to figure everything out without him, then your God is too small. If your God is a demanding parent who is never satisfied and is only out to criticize you or critique you or to tear you down, then your God is too small. If your God is a disconnected creator who may have knit you together in your mother's womb but doesn't care about what you're going through and the difficulties and struggles you're facing in life, then your God is too small. The point I'm trying to to make here is that we all have an image of who we think God is. The question is, is your image too small? Many times our concept of God is not as extreme as as J.B. Phillips may be saying and all, but but sometimes if we're honest, we might admit we've carved God down into a little bit less of what he is. Either way, what I'm saying is that that the God we serve, the one we call Lord, the God we call our Father is bigger than anything we could ever stuff into a box or carve down and to an idol. And he does not want us to settle for anything less than who he is. In all of his majesty, in all of his glory, God wants you to worship him and him alone. And my challenge to us this morning is this, that no matter what your image of God is, no matter what shaped it, no matter how you got to this place where you created this image of him that is less than, than what is revealed to us in Holy Scriptures, that is less than what is revealed to us in Jesus Christ. No matter what it is that has gotten you to this place, whatever, whether it's a bad experience with an authoritative figure in your life or maybe some bad preaching or teaching from another church, whatever it is that has pre- brought you to this place where you have an image of God that is less than who He has revealed Himself to be. And I pray, I challenge you, to take God out of your box because quite frankly God does not fit the Bible is the revealed word of God it is the place God has chosen to reveal himself to us in it it describes God as the creator king priest judge father redeemer shepherd in it we learn how God is the creator of the and the life giver our authority our friend, the giver of grace, the one who calls us to holiness, the lover of our souls, our deliverer, our provider, our salvation, our caregiver. And at the heart of this all 
is this great and wonderful understanding of the most basic and essence of who God is, the most simplest definition that the Bible gives us, that God is love. If your God is anything less than all of that combined, then your God is too small. Take him out of the box. I don't know about you, but, but as I step back and as I, as I look at God, I am in awe and wonder, and I want you to be in awe and wonder too. I want you to step back and look at God and say, you know what, you are almighty. You are all powerful. You are all present. You are all knowing. You are all gracious. You are all loving. And it's your desire, oh Lord, to be in relationship with us. Don't settle for a version of God that is anything less than the God that makes you say, wow, how incredible. I challenge you, if your God is anything less, it's time to put away that idol. And it's time to ask God to reveal himself to you in all his glory. Amen.